I'd like to introduce Senator Jalen. She has a few comments to open the event with. Hi, thank you all for coming. Uh, I know we want to get started. I just wanted to say, when I first heard about chronic fatigue sy syndrome, I th had the same reaction that I know a lot of people have, which is, oh yeah, I'm chronically fatigued too, because I work really hard. I've watched the trailer. I've already learned a little bit. I'm about to learn a lot more. I think this new uh, ME idea will make people less, help people understand that it's a real thing, that it's a physical reality and that it has real effects. So I'm looking forward to learning more. I, probably people have read the Consumer Reports, I think it's this month or last month, about how women's health issues have been so understudied. And here is a real good example of how people have shuffled off women's compl complaints as being, you know, hysterical or um, psychological. And so I think that, that you all are part of changing the conversation, and I thank you for being here. Thank you, Senator Jalen. And um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Senator Jason Lewis, the uh, Senate Chair of the Public Health Committee, and I'm just delighted to uh, see you all at the State House today, um, the People's House, and we're, we're thrilled to, to have you here. Um, I was chatting with Margaret before, and thank you for inviting me to join you, and we believe this is the first event for MECFS at any state house, is that right, in the, in the country. And um, I said, said to Margaret, you know, it's long, long overdue. Like Senator Jalen, I've had my, uh, my own uh, journey here, and, and, and I, admittedly not fully understanding this condition and how, what a devastating toll it takes on, uh, on many thousands of, of people in Massachusetts and around the country. And I just had a personal experience where I have a, a constituent um, who lives in Malden, and somebody who um, I've really gotten to know over the years and relied on because he's so knowledgeable on housing policy, environmental policy. You know, I see Senator Aldridge here, and you know you have constituents like that who come and see you at your office hours, call you, they have bills they want you to file, you know, and this is just, a, just an incredible person. And I hadn't seen him for like over a year. He came to my office hours a month ago, and he told me, you know, he was having a good day, and he was able to come out and see me, and. He explained to me that this is why he was nowhere to be found because of uh, MECFS, and uh, he'd really had to retreat, um, you know, from his active life. Um, so that just was—it was incredible. Really hit 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 home for me, and literally just happened um, a month ago. So wanted to share that, but I think the main reason I was invited to t um, share a few remarks with you is because I'm the lead Senate sponsor of legislation to uh, encourage the adoption of telemedicine or telehealth in Massachusetts. And I'm just thrilled that um, this is a piece of legislation that um, as, a, as a group um, you are getting behind. And uh, there's a wonderful coalition known as the T-Med Coalition. I see Adam Del Molino in the back who's helping to lead that. Um, and we're so glad to have um, you all as part of that coalition. Um, telemedicine or telehealth um, is something that Massachusetts is behind the curve on. Many other states are doing more than we are. Uh, it doesn't obviously replace a regular healthcare system, but it complements it. And it provides more options for both primary care, for specialty care, and for behavioral health for those individuals who, because of transportation reasons, mobility reasons, health reasons, you know, have a difficult time actually getting physically to, to see um, you know, a, a healthcare provider. So we really want to allow um, this to become more prevalent in Massachusetts. Um, the legislation would um, ensure that um, insurers you know, cover telemedicine services appropriately, the same way they do physical care. And also it would, it would make the credentialing process for healthcare providers much more straightforward, because that's another hurdle they face. So the legislation was included in the Senate's um, omnibus healthcare bill that we passed uh, several months ago. Uh, with a lot of support from Senator Jalen and Senator Eldridge, and we're very hopeful that the House of Representatives will include it in their upcoming health care bill, and your advocacy is going to help make ensure that that happens. So thank you again, and great to be with you. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Senator Lewis. Um, welcome to a screening of a clip of unrest, coupled with a discussion of both the disease, ME, CFS, 
in the telemedicine bill, which Senator Lewis just informed us about. And also, I'd like to thank Senator Jalen for coming today, and a couple other senators who came in while we were opening up. Um, Representative, Representative um, Eldridge, thank you very much for coming. Senator. Senator. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I says right there. Um, Representative Sanchez for coming as well. Thank you. Um, okay. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you for coming, Representative Dooley. And Representative, uh, excuse me, and Senator Mike Rush, thank you for coming as well. Thank you. Oh, and Representative Benson. And I have, a, I have a limited amount of information here as far as who walked in the door, obviously. So if I have missed anybody, please feel free to, to inform me. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Representative Feliotis. OK. Well, my name is Robert Price, and I am a volunteer with ME CFS Association. My wife um, has as a sufferer of ME CFS. Um, this spring, the Mass CFEDS Association is holding events around the state to raise awareness about ME CFS, and we are reaching out to folks um, in the healthcare, legislative, and academic communities. This year, so far, we've held events at Emerson College, Harvard Medical School, and Brandeis University. And just recently, last month, over 140 healthcare specialists and healthcare professionals attended an event at the Massachusetts Department of Health, which is a first, mind you, that any health department has hosted such an event. Um, for this fall, we are in discussions to be held at Beth, we are in discussions for events to be held at Beth Israel Hospital, Mass General Hospital, and the Boston University School of Public Health. We are excited to have speakers this evening um, it'll cover scientific researchers, people living with MECFS, and supporters and coordinators of the telemedicine bill. There's a few key facts um, about MECFS, which is good to know. Number one, the actual name of ME is actually very hard to pronounce. It's there, it's the first words on the, the slide above you. If anybody would like to take a crack at pronouncing this name, ma'am. Myalgic encephalomyelitis. That's my wife, actually. <laughs> ME is a multi, the name ME is also chronic, um, commonly referred to as chronic fatigue. However, people who have the illness are not so fond of the term fatigue for many reasons. This is a debilitating illness. Fatigue doesn't begin to sum up how actually debilitating this illness is. ME is a multi-system disease that results in a host of degrading symptoms including neurological abnormalities and an energy production impairment so severe that you can end up debilitated to, too, too debilitated to do simple ordinary tasks such as brush your teeth, make a salad, or talk on the phone. But now imagine this. Imagine that you've spent time on the phone, you've organized an appointment that is a doctor's appointment with a specialist that is three or four months off in the future, even six months off in the future. The morning of that appointment, you get out of bed, you feel good, you're like, okay, I've been planning on this, I'm actually going to go to this appointment. So you get dressed, you have breakfast, you go through your day, you go through your morning routine, and by the time you get to the door, you are too physically disabled to actually make it to the car, to make it to the appointment, and then, once again, you need to call and cancel. And then what do you do? This is it. This is the way my, life and I, my wife and I live our lives. We experience this routinely. This is something that happens quite often. And she is not alone. There's an estimated 1 to 2.5 million Americans afflicted in the United States. 75% of women, there's no diagnostic test, no FDA-approved treatment, no cure. 25% are homebound, 25% and 80 to 90% are not diagnosed or misdiagnosed. Fewer than a dozen medical specialists are available nationally. Symptoms typically persist for years. Recovery is rare. MECFS costs between 17 to 24 billion annually. NIH refunding is low. It's very, very low. It is 
it is the line that you cannot see in the bottom left-hand corner. That is funding. The good news is that last year, the NIH stated, uh, started to fund three research centers around the US, but the amount they gave for that effort is minuscule compared to the need. So much more is actually needed. Massachusetts CFED and MF Association was established in 1985, and it's the first, I should say, um, ME advocacy group in the country. We focus on education, patient support, and advocacy. Most recently, or more recently, given the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, lack of urgency and lack of seriousness in responding to this public health problem, we have started to focus on getting congressional help. As you'll see on the slide, we have secured Senator Markey as a champion for ME. His first act of champion was to hold a congressional briefing about ME on Capitol Hill. And then, a few months ago, we did something groundbreaking. We secured a joint statement of support from the entire MA con congressional delegation saying that they will push for expanded biomedical research opportunities and funding in Congress. And now, on that successful note, here is a clip of unrest, a film about ME CFS that was shortlisted for an Oscar and won a Sundance Award and is changing lives around the globe. Um, our first speaker this evening uh, is Margaret Miley. She's an ME CFS patient advocate and patient for five years. Um, Margaret, what is your ME experience? Thanks again. This is so important. This is the first time I've gotten through that part of that video without crying. So that's that's progress. Uh, that that documentary is very close to home. Um, so my before experience uh, was that I was a uh, full-time working mother of two, live in Acton with my family, uh, was running a statewide nonprofit organization, the Midas Collaborative, which was working with low and moderate income uh, folks on financial security issues. I spent a lot of time in this building, and Senator Eldridge in particular was our, our champion, and um, doing all the volunteer stuff that, that parents, uh, working parents do. Um, few DIY projects with an antique house. Uh, and one day I had a few, a few extra hours, so I went out on a 50-mile bike ride. Felt fabulous afterwards. And little did I know that was sort of the beginning of my uh, new medical life. Uh, a couple days later, came down with a fever. Uh, turned out I had two tick, uh, three tick-borne illnesses, one of which was Lyme. And that was sort of my entry point into what I later um, torturously discovered uh, was ME. So I got ill and I never seemed to get better. I was getting uh, slightly better and then I would get worse and every time I felt well I would work more or try to catch up in life and then I would end up mysteriously in bed very similar, uh, looking not quite as photogenic but in a very similar state as uh, Jennifer Brea in the, in the video. Um, so I had a full workup of everything, uh, neuro, cardio, went to endocrinologists, went to Lyme specialists, um, and I just didn't show up as ill in, uh, in, those, in many of those tests. So um, things went on like that for a few years before I actually saw uh, a TED talk that Jen Brea had done and it started making sense to me and then I started doing a lot more research and reaching out internationally and trying to take advantage of some of the international research on ME. Um, so I, I, I just wanted to describe to you one experience I had just to sort of illuminate this a little bit. I had spent some time in this building in the State House meeting with legislators and others. Um, I could feel the uh, symptoms coming on. I could feel my brain sort of starting to take a turn. I sort of stumbled out of the State House, went down to the parking garage under the uh, Boston Common, rested for a while, and then realized I got to get going or I won't get home to Acton. So I drove home. I uh, can't believe I did it, but um, the symptoms were coming on like a wave. And when I got in my driveway in front of my garage, I stopped and then could not, for the life of me, figure out how to get out of the car and into the house. I just remember struggling to focus and saying, put the car in park, so I didn't 
run into the garage. So that was kind of um, why a number of patients have a hard time with the word fatigue, because this is a whole level higher than fatigue. It is a, a decoupling of your mental processes that, um, as opposed to what you can do physically. So um, this is twice as common as MS. Um, and yet it is not very well known. And one of the reasons I'm here is to represent all the severe patients who have spent, who are spending so much time in bed as I did for many weeks, many, many weeks. Um, this is a good day for me. Um, but I also want to alert people to the prevalence of this disease. It is research starved. It is between the cracks of medical practice. Margaret, and it is excuse twice me, Margaret, as I hate, common I hate as to be MS. Rude, but we're on a time crunch here. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I stuck the landing. You did. You did better than I did. <laughs> I had the stop sign up for a good minute and a half. <laughs> Our next speaker is Michael Van Elziker, PhD. He is a neuroscientist and ME CFS researcher at Harvard Medical School and Mass General Hospital and an instructor at Tufts University. Um, what, what does the scientific research show us? happening in the body of a person with ME-CFS. Hi everybody, thanks so much for coming. And by the way, this, the rest of this documentary is on Netflix and it's worth watching. It's not just sad, it's, it's, it's really good. So we know um, there are essentially two kinds of ways to make energy, aerobic and anaerobic. You probably heard those terms before. And cells have a, sort of a window of aerobic energy production uh, at, at which point they start doing anaerobic energy production. And it seems to be the case that these folks have a much smaller window. Um, it, it pretty rapidly they end up in the anaerobic um, state in which they have to sort of use their own cells for energy. Um, and it also is the case that there seems to be sort of a, a payback where if they have broached the, the window of aerobic energy production, if they've used up that window, um, the following day, 24 hours later, in some cases it's 48 hours later, some people it's a little faster than that, but it's usually sort of a, a fair amount of time, um, that window is closed even further. Um, so it's sort of a limited, it's like a broken battery, uh, it's like a broken rechargeable battery. Um, and I also think it's important to note that there are some very severe people that are home, but there are also people that are out there working in the community um, that that's sort of their limit. What they can do is maybe eight hours, of day, eight hours a day at work and then they go home and crash out and it takes them the whole time to recover. So uh, it's, it's, it's not just a matter of people that are home in bed, although that's super important. There's also people in the community that deal with this uh, as well. There's sort of a spectrum. Um, there's also um, sort of natural um, virus fighting cells called natural killer cells. And there's pretty good evidence that um, those cells have reduced functioning. It's not completely understood why it may be um, as a result of the, the metabolic problems or there may be something that sort of specifically targets those, those immune cells, um, but the ability to fight viruses seems to be depleted. Um, at an epidemiological scale, this condition is associated with shingles, which you know we all have herpes viruses in our bodies. Uh, over 90% of humans have more than one strain. So this is a, a type of a herpes virus that most of us have. Um, and in some cases, uh, usually in the elderly, it gets expressed uh, in, in certain types of nerve tissue. And in an epidemiological scale, that, that is associated with this condition. So some people argue um, that there is a viral story. Um, I think that may be an important part of it. There's probably environmental, um, at, at the very least, vulnerability factors um, that predispose um, someone to neuroinflammation, the, the encephalomyelitis, that's what that means, right? And en encephalo is brain, itis uh, is inflammation. Um, so there seems to be some evidence of uh, central nervous system inflammation. So it's, it's also associated with poverty. So those environmental things that we associate with poverty and you know, environmental racism like um, pollution, um, thanks, um, pollution, mold in the house may be part of it. Um, so that, that also seems to be a factor as well. Yes, thank you, Michael. Our next speaker is, is coming to us via Skype. Her name is Roby Robitaille. She's a former wellness coach, lives with caregiver parents, an ME CFS advocate, organizing a virtual, and is currently organizing a virtual support group for mostly homebound patients. 
And here's Roby here. Um, so a possible question, Roby. Um, what is your ME-CFS story, and what is your experience with the illness, and how is it on a daily basis at home? Sure. Well, um, I'd like to start thanking everyone for taking time out of their busy schedules to be here with us today. And um, bear with me. I'm going to talk a little quickly because I have a lot to say, and I'm going to do a little reading because that will help me stay on time. <laughs> Um, before I became ill with ME, I was a very active person in high school and college. I played sports, lifted weights, worked, had a fun social life. I studied hard and participated in a variety of extracurricular activities. In my early 20s, I lived in New York City where I often had two jobs and I was incredibly social and I, one of my favorite things was to walk around the city exploring neighborhoods for hours. So disease onset and symptom severity varies a lot between patients, which can make ME challenging to research. While many patients experience a sudden onset, I became sick gradually, and my health declined over a period of years, so I have been able to experience a wide range of symptom severity. About 16 years ago, when I was 26, I was just exhausted. I knew something was wrong with my health, but all the doctors that I saw told me that I was either depressed or that I was totally fine and there was nothing wrong with me, even though I knew better. So I spent the next decade trying to make myself better. I became a personal trainer, a yoga instructor, and a nutrition consultant, and I just made wellness a way of life. But no matter what I did, I felt every day like I was thinking through a dense fog and walking through mud. I was only able to work four days a week and spent most of my free time on my couch trying to conserve energy. And this was a real bummer because it um, kept me from doing some real great things, kept me from great opportunities, and it actually made me lose a lot of friends who couldn't understand why I couldn't hang out with them. Five years ago, I knew, long, I knew that I could no longer do a job on my feet, so I quit my job as a wellness coach and I enrolled in a master's program for counseling psychology. Um, about one year into my program, I became mostly housebound. My legs constantly ached and felt really weak. I had a hard time holding myself upright and I felt like I was going to faint a lot of the time. Within the next year, I was mostly bed-bound, and physically and cognitively, I could barely handle one class per semester, but I was super determined to finish, so I continued. In the middle of my 17th course, I actually literally lost the ability to read. My cognitive impair impairment became so bad. So I was forced to drop out of school with only three courses left. It was the most devastating thing I've had to do in my life. By that point, I had drained my savings, and um, I could no longer grocery shop or cook for myself, so I had to move across the country, abandon my dreams, and move in with my parents. Um, now, my graduate courses will begin to um, expire soon, so I will be unable to complete my program, and this is not an unusual story. It's very, very sad. A lot of hardworking people have worked through master's and doctorate programs to only have to either drop out or be housebound because they're too ill after they finish their programs. So you asked about what and having any effects, and it affects everything. Without this video chat, I wouldn't be there to share my story with you. Um, I'm a 42-year-old woman with tons of passions for life. I can no longer drive, hike, read a book, go to church, walk around cities, go dancing, eat at a restaurant, play guitar, do photography, or even draw. On a larger scale, I long to develop my career, find a life partner, raise children, and settle into a home. I, love, I would love to explore our country's state and national parks, strengthen my body, and save for retirement. Instead, I lay alone in bed day after day, Sometimes, sadly, considering that I may be too sick for too long to be able to do any of these things. I sometimes wonder if I will ever be able to support myself financially, and I know that my parents are concerned about what we're going to do when they need caregivers of their own. I often too feel too sick to leave the house to go to see a doctor. 
and my nausea and exhaustion get so bad that I may go up to two weeks without showering, and yes, it is as gross as it sounds, and I'm sure my parents love that I'm sharing that with the room of people right now. I am one of the fortunate ME patients, however, who can actually leave my bed for a couple of hours on good days and leave the house once or twice a month if I'm lucky. Um, there are so many patients who lie in what I call a waking coma that are, they're unable to communicate with the world and they have to be kept alive by their caregivers. So we are desperate for political and medical support and we really appreciate that you care enough to take the time to spend with us today. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Roby. That was, that, was, that was really terrific. Now we're gonna talk for a moment about the benefits of the, um, the telemedicine bill from a patient's perspective. The homebound patients will have access to healthcare via live interactive video calling, and these healthcare appointments will be covered by private insurers, the GIC, and Medicaid. And to tell us more about the, um, the telemedicine bill now is Adam, Del Molino, and um, Adam is director of the state government agency for the Mass Health and Hospital Association and coalition coordinator for the telemedicine bill. Thank you, Adam. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adam Del Molino, and I am the director of state. Sure, uh, I'm the director of state government advocacy for the Massachusetts Health and Hospital Association. Um, MHA does information, education, and advocacy for. Um, both uh, nonprofit and for-profit hospitals here in Massachusetts. Uh, we represent approximately 85 uh, hospitals here in Massachusetts right now. Um, and, and some of the things we can talk about here is um, MHA is the convener of a coalition called the T-Med Coalition, and uh, Senator Lewis alluded to it previously. The T-Med Coalition is an organization uh, comprised of 32 hospital, healthcare provider, um, Let's see who else. We have technology organizations. We have all sorts of different types of groups, consumer organizations in support of telemedicine legislation. So what we're looking for in terms of the telemedicine legislation, and this is kind of, I was watching and I, I hadn't seen the, even the clip of, of the video, so it was very compelling for me and it was impressive to really see and understand um, what a person goes through with ME. Um, as, as we alluded to previously, uh, the legislation that was kind of adopted in the Senate uh, does a couple of things very well. It provides coverage parity across all insurance payers for telemedicine in Massachusetts. It's a very important piece for commercial payers and for the Group Insurance Commission. So that's a very important piece that was included in the Senate Health Act. It's Senate Bill 2211. Uh, secondly, it also includes what's called proxy credentialing, credentialing for telemedicine services to reduce the administrative burden on providing services by way of telemedicine. Now, most people would say, well, what does that mean? Proxy, so credentialing is the process by which when you're working in a hospital that people know who you are and that you are who you say you are. There are entire departments that are working at hospitals to make sure that you have all of the proper credentials, that you have graduated from the appropriate schools, and that you have the proper licensing to provide services in our hospitals. Proxy credentialing for telemedicine, it actually follows the federal rural telehealth model in the Medicare program. And what it essentially says is if I'm providing services, and for, for example, I like to use the example because I'm from the Berkshires. Uh, if the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute is providing services to a patient from out in Pittsfield, and that patient in Pittsfield is receiving services at Berkshire Medical Center. Essentially what you have to do is you, you, you would have to have that physician, oncologist, uh, might be a nurse that's providing the services by way of telemedicine. You'd have to have them go through a full credentialing process at both sites of care. Instead, through what the, has been put forward and passed by the Senate right now, what we would have to do is only have to do uh, one credentialing process at the original site they provide that credentialing process, it's, um, and then they do a one-page attestation under the pains and penalties of perjury that you are who you say you are, and you can provide the credentialing services, and provide telemedicine services at the remote site location, for example, at Berkshire Medical Center in Pittsfield. So, the, and then finally, in the interest of time and being quick, uh, the other thing that we're really pushing for in telemedicine legislation and, and as we're having conversations between the House and Senate is making sure that there's a flexible definition for telemedicine. We want to make sure that we're including all technologies. So 
One of the things that the Senate bill is very strong on and does very well is it covers interactive telemedicine services, but there are other types of services and asynchronous technologies, which I think would be very important for the ME uh, CFS community in particular, is you would be able to have uh, a store in Ford. So you could have somebody that kind of performs perhaps a dermatological exam or other type of exam that would kind of, um, how shall I just say this, um, could be stored, recorded, and stored, and then forwarded and reviewed by a healthcare provider afterwards. And that's really a critical piece. We want to make sure that those, what we call asynchronous types of care, are also covered by the insurance companies here in Massachusetts. So I hope that's, uh, hope that's helpful. So thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for your support um, for the telemedicine legislation. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Adam. That was very informative. Thank you. Um, just a couple closing comments. One, thank you for coming. We really appreciate you coming and learning more about MECFS, the telemedicine bill. Um, and just a couple dates coming up. Um, on May 31st, we have a Department of Health event coming up at Cooley Dickinson Hospital in Northampton. And we have a researcher and doctor forum at the Newton Wellesley Hospital on November 3rd. Um, so save the dates. There'll be good events. Um, once again, there's brochures on the table. Um, and contact us at masscfids.org. Um, to either volunteer, ask any questions, or if you want, you can actually bring this event and the entire film in a panel to your location, to your office, to your community center, to your hospital, local hospital. Um, and please, feel free to take handouts in the back. And once again, um, st stay after the event if you have questions. We're going to have a question and answer, and we'll be happy to... Um, to hear, to hear comments, questions, whatever. But thanks, thank you for coming, and um, very good. Thank you.